Hi, I'm Lynn Cornell, and welcome to Journey Through the Bible Verse by Verse. Grab your Bibles and follow along as we study through each book of the Bible verse by verse and chapter by chapter. Now, I'm using the Holman Christian Standard Bible, so if you're reading from a different Bible translation, the read will be different, but the message will be the same. We're going to continue in our study through the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 14. Verse 1, at that time, Herod the Tetrarch heard the report about Jesus. This is John the Baptist, he told his servants. He has been raised from the dead, and that's why supernatural powers are at work in him. For Herod had arrested John, chained him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother's, Philip's wife. Since John had been telling him, it is not lawful for you to have her. Though he wanted to kill him, he feared the crowd, since they regarded him as a prophet. But when Herod's birthday celebration came, Herodias' daughter danced before them and pleased Herod. So he promised with an oath to give her whatever she might ask. And prompted by her mother, she answered, Give me John the Baptist's head here on a platter. Although the king regretted it, he commanded it he commanded that it be granted because of his oath and his guests. So he sent orders and had John beheaded in prison. His head was brought on a platter and given to the girl who carried it to her mother. Then his disciples came, removed the corpse, buried it, and went and reported to Jesus. Now, a couple of background information. Some background information here. Herod was the son of Herod the Great, who, in the beginning of the gospel story, we see here. Remember, in the beginning chapters, when Jesus was born and the wise men had came to Jerusalem, uh, Herod the Great had uh, inquired about the birth of Jesus, where he was. He wanted to know where the baby was so he can destroy the baby. Now, Herod the Great was very paranoid. Uh, any, any one or anything that he perceived as a threat to his rulership, he would eliminate, uh, including killing his wife and one of his sons. Now, when he died, um, his kingdom was divided to his sons. And so this Herod, and the name Herod is like a dynasty name, so the, the, the name is passed from father to son, from generation to generation. Okay? So, um, but this Herod proved to be, as with all men with unchecked power, corrupt, evil, brutal, cruel, and also immoral. Now, Herod, as with them, these rulers, they ruled under the authority of Rome. And as long as they kept the people subject to Rome, to Rome's laws, um, they really didn't care how these leaders ruled. So Herod, um, the Tetrarch, and he was ruler over really a section in other words, he only had a section of his father's uh, reign. And uh, another part was given to his brother. Now you can see the shenanigans that's going on, sort of the scandals today would make headlines, how that uh, Herod had married his brother's wife. And being a Jew, John the Baptist called him, on, called him out on that, that he was in violation of the law. He was committing adultery. Now, Herodias hated John for that. And the opportunity for her revenge came when her daughter danced before Herod. And it was such a seductive dance that Herod, <clears throat> with an oath, promised her whatever she asked for, up to half the kingdom, he would grant it. Now, what's interesting about this, if you had that offer, if you had that, if someone said, if a king, somebody in power said, said, um, well, I will grant you up to half my kingdom. Now, the term up to half my kingdom was a term of hyperbole that um, no, nobody took it in actuality seriously. In other words, it was, just, it was a phrase. She could have asked for a position. She could have asked for some type of power, but certainly in a literal sense, not half the kingdom. But she still could have asked for something great. She could have asked for money. She could have, you know. And what's interesting is that in her hatred, 
that what she asked for was the head of John the Baptist. Now, it's interesting that we see this kind of perspective here, and when we read all of the Gospels, we get kind of a full picture. While Herod was angry or incensed that John was calling him out, he also was intrigued with John, and he would talk with John. He didn't necessarily change, but he would certainly talk with John. And he came to actually kind of like John. So when this, when this uh, demand from Herodias' daughter came, prompted by her mother, uh, Herod actually tried to get out of it. <laughs> um, but the hatred in her mother's heart wouldn't allow it. Now think about this for a moment. So John is executed. He's beheaded. The head is put on a platter. The platter is handed to the daughter. The daughter comes and says, here, Mama, here's your gift. What do you do with a severed head? I'm saying that to kind of show the uh, depravity here of this person. All right. So they went and they reported it to Jesus. Um, verse 13. When Jesus heard about it, he withdrew from there by boat to a remote place to be alone. And when the crowds heard this, they followed him on foot from the town. And as he stepped ashore, he saw a huge crowd, felt compassion for them, and healed their sick. Now, kind of interesting that Jesus didn't even have grieving time. He wanted to grieve. He wanted to uh, kind of isolate. But the demands of the ministry were so great, he couldn't even do that. But notice this, he felt compassion for them. Verse 15, when evening came, by the way, he felt compassion and he ministered to them. He healed them. They were, there was such great need, okay? Which is kind of interesting because you would think the leadership of the Pharisees, why, were, why weren't they meeting these needs? So when Jesus came along and there was just floodgates of the grace of God being poured out on them, healings upon healings upon healings, people literally flocked. And these weren't fake healings, by the way, either. Like you see in some of these ministries today. You know, the evangelistic meetings, they, they certainly gather crowds. But are the people really getting healed? All right. Verse 15, when evening came, the disciples approached him and said, This place is the wilderness, and it is already late. Send the crowds away so they can go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Now, they had been camping out with Jesus, by the way. Uh, we, we would call this, in a sense, today a camp meeting. And, um, and so um, they, would, they were there getting healed. They were here listening to the word of God. And it was kind of captivated by Jesus. And so now it's late. Notice Jesus' response. Verse 16, they don't need to go away, Jesus told them. You give them something to eat. Verse 17, but we only have five loaves and two fishes here. They said to him, bring them here to me, he said. And then he commanded the crowds to sit down on the grass. He took the five loaves and the two fishes, and looking up to heaven, he blessed them and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowd. And everyone ate and was filled then they picked up 12 baskets full of leftover pieces. Now those who were, now those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. Now, um, again, just in the custom of the day, they really didn't count the women. So the count of 5,000 is men. So this crowd conservatively could have been anywhere from 15 to 20,000 people, conservatively. More likely more. And it, the fact that Jesus when he multiplied the food, and by the way, he did this in front of them, and they ate and were filled. So that means some of them came back for seconds, maybe thirds, you know. You know how some people are. Now, think about this. When you go to a banquet hall, right, and you, you get one plate, <laughs> and, and you may not be filled on it. Notice Jesus fed them, and then they were filled. Verse 22, and by the way, this, this sign shows the Messiah providing for their needs and the greater scope of providing for their needs eternally, providing for their needs, the shepherd, you know, providing and shepherding them. Verse 22, immediately he made the disciples get into a boat and go ahead of him 
to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After dismissing the crowd, he went up to the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone, but the boat was already over a mile from land, battered by the waves because the winds were against him. And around three in the morning, he came towards them walking on the sea. When his disciples saw, saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. It is a ghost, they said, and cried out in fear. Immediately, Jesus spoke to them, have courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it is you, Peter answered, answered him, command me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. After climbing out of the boat, Peter started walking on the water and came towards Jesus. But when he saw the strength of the wind, he was afraid and beginning to sink. He cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand, caught hold of him and said to him, oh, your little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased, then the boat and those in the boat worshipped him and said, truly, you are the son of God. Now, this is kind of an amazing story. Not that Jesus walked on the water. Yes, that's amazing. And in fact, it's not amazing that Jesus walked on the water because he's the son of God. It would have been amazing to see it. Yes. But what is amazing is that here Peter walks on the water. And as he's watching the circumstances around him, the wind, the waves, he loses faith and begins to sink. Now, thank God Jesus is merciful, right? Jesus saves him. But even Jesus kind of expressed amaze. <laughs> Why did you doubt, right? I mean, on a calm day, you couldn't walk on the water. On a calm day, the circumstances wouldn't have been more or less favorable. In other words, on a calm day, you know, you wouldn't be able to say, well, it's calm. I can walk on the water now. No. Whether it's whether the if, if it was um, the way that it happened in meteors was hidden, it still would have been a, a miraculous act for you. Why did you doubt? And the very fact that he was walking on the water, it's even more kind of amazing that he would doubt that he's walking on the water. It's like, oh, I can't do this because of the waves. Jesus kind of like what? All right. So verse 34. Um. Once they crossed over, they came to the land of Genesaris, and when the men of that place recognized him, they alerted the whole vicinity and brought to him all who were sick, and they were begging him that he might only touch the tassel of his robe, and as many as touch uh, were made perfectly well. Um, one can help but remember maybe the story about the lady who touched the hem of his garment, the one who had the issue of blood for 12 years, and she touched the hem of his garment and was healed. One can't help but remember that this story probably got around. Or people just kind of was just crowding, even formulating, if I can just touch, because power was coming out of this man. You know, multitudes were healed by this man. So, well, all right, um, we're going to pick it up in chapter 15 next time. So I'll see you then. Okay.